This is System Trader Show, episode number seven. Welcome to System Trader Podcast. Listen to interviews with top traders and find out how the most successful traders beat the markets and what are the secrets of their success. This is System Trader Podcast with your host, Jack Lempart. Robert Pardo is a legendary trader and long-term hedge fund manager. He worked, for example, with Goldman Sachs and Dunn Capital Management. He's a pioneer in algorithmic trading and inventor of walk-forward analysis. Using his excellent trading system and sound risk management, he made a 142% return in 2008. Hello, Bob. Um, you are among the most renowned traders so that many people already know a lot about you. Could you please, however, give us some short background of your trading career and what are you doing at the moment? Sure. Um, you know, I basically, I was, I got exposed to trading, um, through working on the, on the CME IMM trading floor years ago. And the last place that I really, the last firm that I worked for before I went out on my own was Solomon Brothers when there still was a Solomon Brothers. Um, and we, I was the floor manager for their operation and we pretty much just did, we pretty much kind of worked for John Merriweather, who was the, you know, of long-term capital, uh, long-term capital fame. And, um, that was pretty, and the, so I really got, a, I, I got an exposure to trading from being on the floor there. And I also got exposure because John actually had an associate who was actually doing computer modeling. And that was among the first I'd ever really heard about that. So that was kind of a, that was kind of an eye opener. Um, then I got involved with, um, basically I, I got interested from a, an associate of mine uh, in actually, um, learning how to, you know, create mathematical trading signals. Although we didn't call them, we just called them signals in those days. Um, and they were actually pretty rare uh, and scarce and people were really interested in that. So I got a, I got, I, was first doing it by hand, actually on, on hand charts. If people can, if people ever even know what those look like, um, and then I got uh, an Apple II computer and taught myself how to program, so I could actually start testing trading strategies, and that led me to creating software, and we created um, a program called Chartist, which became Advanced Chartist, which became Advanced Trader, um, and other programs called thing, things like Blast. Um, a, actually a precursor of Ranger, which we have now again, um, in a more sophisticated form and many others like that. Um, advanced trader ultimately was, was like a DOS version of, of trade station, other than it, it wasn't live, but it was had every other functionality whereby you could create your own tra trading strategies, um, and test them. Um, that led us into working for, um, doing a, a, a long-term consulting project for Goldman Sachs. And we basically adapted um, Advanced Trader to um, their environment, which in those days they, they were using something called OS2, which maybe, I don't know if anybody's ever even heard of that, but it was a, um, a very, a, a really good, a really good operating system that IBM created, but never went anywhere. Um, and we adapted it so it actually worked live on all of their data feeds, including, you know, non, so they would they would like had they had the Platts data and so forth. So they were running technical analysis um, on on non market data, even you know back in the early nineties. That project ended, and we then uh, I then developed. A, I had a client who was with Daiwa Securities of America. He was an American who ran their their American brand their division, and uh, he was a customer of mine from the software side. And we had agreed to basically build a a, a platform to, to manage money. Um, and it was, it was, and that was that was back in '93. And the idea of a multi-strategy um, program was actually pretty unusual. But we put it together, um, and it actually performed better than specification, better than better than the specification. But they had had problems uh, financially because of the crash in Japan, and they cut out all on all, all business that didn't produce strict commissions. So he, my client said to me, he said, Bobby, this is, it's all yours. So, um, uh, the, that, that a, pe a very small piece of that became our XT99 program. And, uh, we ran that with Dunn for about 12 years and, um, it performed exceptionally well. It produced an annualized rate of return of about 20% for 12 years. So, 
Um, since then, we uh, we ended our relationship with Dunn, and uh, I uh, I'm now I'm doing some consulting. We sell you know, we sell a program called Ranger, um, and I'm in the process of we built a, a whole new program um, that's four or five generations beyond the XT99 um, and called Part of Renaissance, which actually is highly multi-strategy and performs extremely well. We're, we're looking to, we're looking to launch that now um, as a prop trading program, which will then also develop into um, a managed account program. Okay. Thank you very much for that. It sounds very interesting. Um, it, it seems like you have like uh, four decades of experience, right? I guess you could say that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, wow. It's it's really um, exceptional. And also regarding to OS two, by the way, I know it because I used to work uh, for IBM as well. So so I know that stuff. Um, uh, I will I, I will get back to some details in um, in, in a while uh, to ask you uh, more uh, detailed questions about things you mentioned. Um, First of all, regarding the uh, XT99 diversified trading program, as you said, it it, it produced an, um, a very uh, good results. Um, so, but as far as I know, you're not offering this anymore at the moment, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, so uh, it it was replaced by uh, by the Renaissance diversified program, right? Correct. Yes. Um, so, how uh, is um, the, the Renaissance Diversified Program different from the previous program? I mean, the XT99. Are you using this program now for your trading as well? We're not trading it right now because it's we the way we built it. It requires a twenty million dollar account, and I don't, don't. So we don't really trade that. We're looking to start trading components of it, um, and uh, but that's what's going to be running in the uh, in the prop trading of prop trading program and other managed accounts. We're uh, building faster stuff um, for our, you know, house trading, shall we say. Okay. I understand. Thank you. And now it's the way it's different is, um, I mean, actually X, the original XT 99 algorithm actually is still in Renaissance. Um, we, the only reason why we ended is, you know, we ended the relationship with Don and uh, because it had a large drawdown in nine after having, the big, it made 142% in, in eight and lost like 45% in nine. Um, and a lot of people, you know, the, the appetite for risk when we first started doing this was entirely different than it is today. And a lot of people just got, just kind of got, um, they they were turned off by the, by the risk, even though we found ways to, to re we re-engineered XT99, um, and eliminated actually most of that risk and volatility. But in any case, um, I just kind of got tired of having to talk about that conversation with people. And even though it's <laughs> people still ask me about that, they still actually ask me about it now when I show them Renaissance. I actually had a guy who was really interested in, in, in doing Renaissance and his, his associate actually said, well, your other program has, has too much volatility. We can't do it. I said, it's nothing like that program, but you know, that's so people have, they, they get ideas in their head and it's pretty hard to get them out sometimes. So I, I get tired of that conversation. So um, that's why we own. And actually, you know, it's, it's more and more, it's, it's more, it's becoming more and more expensive to run, uh, you know, a, a hedge fund than it ever used to be. Um, and it's more and more difficult. So having this association with this prop trading firm uh, takes a lot of the, takes a lot of the nonsense off, takes a lot of the nonsense that I would have, that I used to have to deal with out of my hand. So um, I'm very, I'm, I would like that idea. Okay. You just mentioned that you made a hundred forty two percent in one year in two thousand eight. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, that's 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 amazing. And uh, yeah, it was a good year. <laughs> yeah, but then it's a problem maybe for customers because they maybe have a higher expectations <laughs> afterwards. Well, uh, I can tell you a story about that if you want. If right, you, yeah, sure. I, go ahead, please. Yeah. I had um be, before the year was over, we were I was having conversations with a guy who was, they were very successful at raising money for hedge funds and they were New York centric. And yeah, I don't know if you know how, I mean, there's a real, there's a real difference in the, there's a real difference in the style and the attitude towards trading in, in the Chicago versus New York. New York is very stock centered um, and very um, formal. Uh, Chicago still, even with the proud trading firms is still, they trade everything now in the proud trading firms, but they're still, you know, we're still the home of, of futures and it's a, there's still it's, it's kind of a looser attitude. People aren't 
aren't as aren't as rigid as they um, as I've seen them be um, in the hedge fund space. But um, well, anyway, so this guy came to he when he wanted he, he thought the hedge funds were having trouble and he wanted to basically um, he wanted to see if he could raise money for us. So he came out for his due diligence. And we were up about 100% at that particular point in time. And he said to me, and, I, and he said to me, and, and I, 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 he said to me at that point, you know, if pe- people think that if you can make 100% a year, you can also lose 100% a year. I said, that's not the way it works. <laughs> that's not the way that, it doesn't work that way. If we don't clean up, if we don't clean up in times like this, because that was a crash and so forth, um, I said, if we don't clean up, we're not doing our job. This is the whole point. Sometimes there's going to be, there's going to be this, you know, these obscene profits. But if we didn't get them, we're not doing our job. So, um, but I couldn't, I couldn't change, he, I couldn't change his mind about them. He literally was of he, and I, I think even he was kind of okay with it. But I think um, he thought that the people he talked to were not. Um, that, that was before we had our. That was that was, that was still that was the, at the at the end of two thousand eight. So we're still and, and ironically. We talked about how we could, you know, we could, if we could make a hundred, we could lose a hundred. In that run up to making 142%, we never, our biggest drawdown in that entire year was 10%. Wow. So it was one of those years you just kind of dream about. Um, and if you trade long enough, you will have this. I mean, the number of stories I can tell you about guys that I knew who were floor traders who got rich because of a windfall um, and then made a good living after that. Um, I, they're just, they could fill a book. Um, if this, and you trade, when you trade it, when you trade long enough, you will get windfalls and it's your job as a trader, uh, to, to capitalize on those windfalls as much as you possibly can. Okay. That's a great story. And do you think that after such a big, uh, big, uh, winning year, do you think it's good to take some money uh, off the table and just to, <laughs> and you know, as to foresee yeah, that I, it will not happen again? I think it's a very astute question. Yes. I think, um, I had a conversation with some people who uh, had my course and we, you know, we do these trainings quarterly and, uh, they asked about, you know, um, waiting pro, you know, how you wait, how you wait to trades and so forth and how you allocate capital. And I said, the biggest problem always with any allocation routine is basically when you're, when, when, no matter how, no matter how good the streak has been, they all come to an end. Every winning streak comes to an end. Um, and then, and this is the way it is. And the, the, the biggest problem with, with the allocation of capital really is that you will be trading at your biggest size as we were when, after a big run up. And if you really hit, if you really hit a bad, if you really hit a bad patch, uh, you'll be trading, you'll be trading this through this negative, this negative, negative period of drawdown with, at your biggest size. Um, and you can, you can lose money is you can lose it very very quickly so yes taking some taking some money off the table is a simple way to do that uh yes uh because yes um and to make it more if you to be, make a more sophisticated asset management allocation would actually incorporate that kind of that kind of procedure on a, on, a, on a systematic basis okay that's very interesting thank you very much for that uh, bob uh you mentioned your cooperation with the Dun capital management uh could you tell us a bit more about this cooperation? Were they just using your XT99 program? Yeah, basically they just did. They, they, um, they, yeah, they pretty much ran it for me. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really have to do much of anything. Um, they, they ran the program and we uh, split fees. Okay. It was actually pretty nice, you know. Uh, because uh, I know Dan Capital is known from uh, using the trend following approach, so um, I was just asking if if just XT ninety nine is also very close to that uh, to that approach. Well, it, at the time, it was their most successful program, um, and the it is lumped in with the long term trend followers because of its trading pace. Uh, XT ninety nine was always what I would call trend anticipatory. Um, you know, Ranger, for example, is based on uh, a very evolved concept of range breakout. Um, the XT99 would, does not function in, in any kind of breakout capacity. It's more in the family of a, a more sophisticated um, volatility breakout. And so it, it generally, but because of the way we structured it, it generally got into trends a lot earlier uh, than the long-term trend followers would. 
And uh, that's one, that was one of the things that was very nice about it. I would like to talk about uh, a walk forward analysis in a second, but before we will go into the details, I wanted to ask you if work forward analysis was used also uh, at Dan uh, Capital because um, I, I thought initially when I was reading about your cooperation that maybe they wanted also use your experience with that approach of of testing and developing the the, the strategies that how to reoptimize uh, the strategies. So was work forward analysis uh, used uh, uh, at the time uh, and done with by Dan Capital? I can't really tell you exactly what it is they did do. I can tell you what they did with my, I know what they did with my stuff. Um, but they, they did not know about, there was a guy named Pierre Toulier who was the president of Dunn at that time, who was a really great guy. Um, and he was very, um, was very sophisticated in terms of his understanding of building strategies and testing them. And, uh, they did not, they had never heard of walk forward analysis to my knowledge prior to that, prior to me get, getting there. And I, from what I understand, they never, they're very, they've always been very secretive, shall we say, private. Even they don't, they would never tell me what, what it is there. They never, they, for, I never really knew what, it, I mean, I kind of knew what their strategy was, but, um, we never really went into details about it. They were private about that, which is understandable. Yeah. Um, but I think I, I, I got the impression that they began to incorporate walk forward analysis, um, as time went on. As Bill told me once, because, you know, the biggest problem with walk forward analysis has always been being able to pick the strategy to, to, to being able to pick the right strategy to, to, to walk forward. And, uh, for, and, and when Bill finally figured that out, I mean, Bill Dunn, when he finally figured out that, how, to, how to do that, I think that's when they began to start using it that way. But I, I, but I can't say for sure. I know that um, they do, they kind of did um, an anchored walk forward with my stuff. Um, go, they would, they'd reoptimize XT99 once a year. Um, but the strategies were picked manually, systematically, but yet done by, done by, it was done manually, not by a computer. Okay. And I built uh, the original, the, the original version of XT99 was actually built with a walk forward analysis. I mean, I, I, I actually, it was built, it was actually built, um, in the, um, in the early 90s before, long before I ever started trading it. Okay. And it was done with walk forward analysis. Okay. Thank you for that. I will go into more details about the walk forward analysis in a minute. But just last question. Um, I, I'm just wondering if walk forward analysis approach can be used in uh, for the long term trend following strategies. Do you, do you see usage for such approach there? Uh, sure. I don't. I don't think there's. I, I don't think there's any strategy, any type of strategy, strategy which doesn't benefit from walk forward analysis. Because what happens is. Um, you, you have to have a lot of data because you have to typically, um, when you're testing a longer term strategy, you're looking at windows that may be six, eight, even 10 years long, um, and opt in and, and, and maybe you're walking them forward for maybe, you know, a year or two. Um, and I, that's perfectly valid. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, as you are known as an inventor of, of walk forward analysis, uh, what is known as walk forward analysis, is there any story behind this finding? I mean, are you still using it in the same way or the methodology evolved, um, during the time? Uh, it has evolved. Um, and, uh, just so you know, um, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of interesting things about, um, you know, walk forward analysis because, Ultimately, um, the way it, it kind of it, it evolved kind of organically as as of need. Um, when I first I put out a program in the early '80s called Swing Trader, um, and it was one of the first really v valid, optimizable trading strategies that you know an investor could buy it and build his own strategies for his own market and trade it. Um, and in those days, it was on. We we eventually evolved it into the IBM. When I first came up, but that's still the, the 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 resources these computers had are a joke compared to what they have nowadays. Um, you know, my 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 iPhone has is probably ten thousand times more powerful than that first <laughs> I, that first the Apple II that I had, and, and, and it, it's 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 staggering to me. But that's the way it is. But we literally had a very very we could it was very difficult to even load much more than a year of data. Um, so. One of, and one of the things that I, I had found and in, in, in experimenting with the strategies and customers would tell me that they would actually, like I had a customer who actually was trading bonds with, with Swing Trader and he literally built, it, it, 
he built a new street. He optimized it every week. So he was like doing um, a, a one week, you know, rolling walk forward analysis. And uh, he did it all manually, of course, but he was willing to do it because he was doing very well in the markets. So we had kind of, and also I realized that, you know, what, what most people did anyway is um, they, you know, if you, we had guys who were floor traders who were, who were buying swing trader and stuff. And I don't know if you've ever really, really known any floor trader types, but um, they're, uh, I don't know, it's, it, it may sound strange to hear this, but a lot of floor trader, ment- the, the floor trader mentality is very risk averse. So one of the things they would do is they would just kind of they would just kind of reoptimize it every once periodically, just because out of out of anxiety or <laughs> out of nervousness about what the hell. Let's make sure it's it's the best it can be and so forth. So it's like looking at your souffle when you're when the oven opening the oven when you're making a souffle. You know you don't want you can wreck it, but they they would do it anyway. Um, so it kind of, then I also and so I started thinking about it and I realized that we had he had a money management company. That I, I was approached by a guy who had a broker's firm. You know, he had an IB, an introducing broker, and he wanted to run some money. And he said he could raise he could raise twenty five thousand dollar accounts. And so we could do we would just you know we run these models with it. And I had a customer who actually had made a lot of good models um, with swing traders, so we were using those. But um, you know, I, I I was never really involved. I was actually I was very little. I was all. I, Actually, all I really ever did there was I, I, I used they used my technology and I got I made quite I made good money with 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 that business, but I wasn't really involved with building the strategies, which was actually a mistake on my part. But in any case, I wasn't at that particular point in time. And he was trying to be he, the models kind of hit a bad patch. Um, and one of the things people didn't really understand in those days because this kind of method of trading was so so relatively new. Even good strategies can hit bad periods. And have, have drawdown periods, and people are much more accommodating of drawdowns now than they ever were in those in those days. So um, we kind of, I, I kind of realized, well, maybe the best thing you really did. I told him, he said, you have to do this walk forward stuff, but you have to do it. He would have to do it manually, and he just, he, he was, he was just literally, he just didn't want to do that. He was, it was too much work for him. So they that the, the end of that story was that the, that that program came to an end, um, and I actually took over. A couple of some months later with a whole new program. Um, but in any case, I also realized that there's a method in statistics called the Kalman Calm, filter, which maybe you've heard of. Yes. And basically it basically it's, it's essentially a rolling walk forward. Uh, so well, I thought, well, let's, let's, let's see if we can't do this. Um, and so we had a program um, and I've, and I've never looked back. I, I would never trade a strategy. I, I can't. I would never trade a strategy with one one proviso that wasn't a walk forward to test it. Um, I just don't think it's it's it's, fee, it's it's a there's no there's there's really no way of knowing what what you really have until you put it through the walk forward testing process. The only time that you can actually doing it without walk forward analysis, you really have to be really good at what you're doing to analyze um, an optimized strategy to make sure you haven't fooled yourself. So, to me, um, the and plus. The biggest benefit of walk forward analysis, of course, or one of the biggest benefits is that um, with programs that are very sensitive to changes in, in, in the in, in the market environment, um, if, especially trading ones, ones that trade frequently, typically walk forward analysis will give you better performance um, than just optimizing uh, a strategy would. Uh, so that's one of the one of the big advantages, of course. Um, and one of the things, by the way, that I've found that's kind of an interesting aside is that, you know, there's a lot of techniques, people, there's a lot of methods out there that have been, that are kind of in the public domain that people think because they're in the public domain, they probably really aren't, aren't really very good. But I've been, I've found, for example, that with a little bit of effort and creativity, um, and adding a few filters to like, even like a, a, um, a three moving average strategy, uh, with walk forward analysis, you can actually do very well with that. So it, it has a way of breathing a life um, into uh, into older strategies or public domain strategies that people think really aren't all that great. But that's kind of a this kind of, that's kind of an extra plus to it all. Regarding the walk forward analysis, um, I know it it may be 
a very big question, but are there any golden rules, let's say best practices, which could help to use it properly? Or maybe uh, let's put it the other way around. I mean, how not to do it? Because um, one of the goals of using the walk forward analysis is to avoid the curve fitting uh, pitfalls. So uh, are there any, any, any tips you could uh, provide how not to use it so that we can obtain that goal to not curve fit our, our strategy? Well, I'd say, I would say that um, you, you kind of apply almost the, some of the same principles to a walk forward analysis as you would to an optimization. Um, but firstly, we don't, um, I mean, for example, if somebody thinks that like doing an optimization on 10 years of data and then hold, and holding out two um, and then seeing how it does in those two is sufficient, um, they're wrong. It, it, it may be, uh, and it really depends on the overall strategy and so forth. But in general, I think you're probably, you're probably, it's, it's kind of a dangerous practice to do the app. Um, cause you can actually, you will find if you, if you look at walk forward analyses, uh, there, there'll be times in, in a successful walk forward analysis when you'll have a, walk, a particular walk forward that will actually fail. It'll, in other words, it'll, it'll lose money and, and it's out of sample period. That's part of what happens. So what we found is, that yes, just like you can fool your, you can fool yourself um, by thinking that uh, by just doing a, a couple of a couple of walk forward analyses um, can be profitable. Um, but you know it can it, if you have a situation, for example, let's say you did a walk forward analysis, you did you did two out of sample windows, which to me is not really even a walk forward analysis, but some might consider it to be one, um, and you're doing it on. Uh, a market that has been extremely trendy. You know, in any tr- any trading strategy that can't make money in a strong trend um, isn't isn't worth anything. I mean, uh, the simple truth is, in, in, a, in a really strong trend, just about any any decent method will actually make money. Um, so you have to. So you, it's very possible. It's very important when you do a walk forward analysis to get as mu- as many different kinds of market scenarios as, as you possibly can into that walk forward analysis. Uh, ideally you want to have, I mean, the, in the, in the perfect world, you'd have a sideways market. You'd have a, you'd have a, a congested market. You'd have a, a couple of roaring bull markets. You'd have a couple of calm, calmer bull markets. You'd have a couple of really extended bear markets. You want to have as much in the regime as possible. Um, so that's, that's one important thing. Um, and you want to have as many walk forwards as you can in, in the, in the analysis. So one of the things we have done of late is we we tend to do faster. We even when we built XT ninety nine, we were still we were doing very very fast walk forwards. But Dunn didn't like that. They wanted something a little slower, like their other stuff. So they changed that, and that was okay because it, it worked. But um, one of the things we found is um, is that the faster you trade, the faster your drawdown recovery is. The faster you trade, the faster you compound. Uh, so. There's all kinds of benefits and advantages of trading faster. Um, so, and uh, one of the advan- benefits, of course, is if you do a walk, if you do a walk forward analysis on 20 years of data, or let's say on 10 years of data, and you're looking at a like a six year in sample window and uh, you know a, a two year out of sample window, what's well, a little bit of a stretch? But let's, let's say it's eight by two. Um, you may only have you know seven or ten walk forwards in there. So then if you're, you, and it doesn't mean, for example, that you couldn't, couldn't do it, but you have to be a lot more careful in terms of looking at the internal structure of the walk forward. Um, but if you do something on a, on a much, let's say you're looking at a one year in sample and a three month out of sample, you're going to get four, th- you're going to probably get four or five times. As, I didn't do the math, but you're going to get four or five times as many actual walk forwards. And each one of those walk forwards, in my opinion, is, is a test. So. If you wind up having um, 30, 30 walk forwards and 26 of them are profitable, um, that's great. Um, but if you wind up having, let's say, like in, in crude, for example, it, 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 most of the stuff we, when we back test the slower stuff, it's always skewed frequently by the big gigantic moves that made so much money for XT99 in 89, but it skews the back testing. Um, so you have to be very, very careful. And this is, I, I go over all this stuff in my course too, that, you know, the, the building better trading strategies, but you have to be very careful that you don't, um, 
that you really don't have a concentration of performance in any, any one particular sample. Um, that's another thing. Uh, so you want to have as many walk forwards as you can. Uh, you don't, you'd like to have the performance relatively evenly distributed throughout the entire period. Um, you want to have a lot of trades. You want to have a lot of walk forwards. So um, that's why, uh, you know, we've kind of pushed more towards the faster walk forwards to be able to get um, greater confidence. Plus, the simple truth is in something like the stock market, which is so volatile, um, the, adapti- the adaptability um, of a faster walk forward, of course, is, is, is much more, is, it stays much more with the contemporary, with, with, with what's happening versus a, you have something that doesn't get react, it only gets reoptimized every two, every two years. Um, I guess you just better have, I mean, I, I, I know I, as I've gotten older, I never have been the world's most patient guy, but as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little bit less patient about, about, uh, you know, about drawdowns. So I want the, I want fast recovery. So that recovery comes from, comes from the faster, tr- faster trading and the faster walk forwards. Okay, great stuff. Makes Thank sense. you very much. Yes, it makes sense. Definitely. It's very, very, very great stuff. Um, so regarding the walk forward analysis, uh, do you think that alternative approach, uh, which uh, is based on uh, parameters diversification, do you think it may make sense or you definitely prefer walk forward analysis? What do you mean by parameter diversification? Uh, I mean that the same rather than um, every uh, some time to reoptimize the system, uh, in the walk forward, uh, approach, you just have, a uh, one strategy, which is running, um, in parallel in a few sets of, of, of parameters so that rather than reoptimize it, you are just splitting this, uh, into few sets of parameters and you're running them at the same time. Well, um, I have never been, to me, that's kind of like what I think is actually a better idea. And that's what we did in Renaissance is they actually have a, a basket of uncorrelated strategies on a particular market. So we have routinely 10 to 15 strategies trading um, in Renaissance and any particular stock index. And we actually have a larger basket from which you pick those. I think that's a better better idea because you okay. get diversification. But if you take, it depends, it, it really depends upon the strategy and upon the, the, the parameters. So for example, if you have, let's say, let's, let's take something simple and say you're looking at a moving average strategy. If you're looking at some, if one, if the primary, the prime driver is, uh, you know, five by twenty, um, and then the secondary drivers are like two by, uh, let's say two by ten, and say, um, I don't know, ten by thirty, you know, they, those are pretty far apart. They may not be super correlated, so you have to you have to test the correlation because if you have, let's say, uh, conversely to that, if you have, um, if you have 10 by 40, and then you go 8 by, um, you go 8 by 36, and you go 12 by um, 42, they're going to be the same. It's pretty much the same strategy. So you just, and so I don't think there's, there could be benefits to the app um, in terms of being able to increase capacity if that becomes an issue. Um, but there, I don't think there's benefits in terms of be, giving it, making the strategy more robust. Okay, it makes sense. Yeah, thank you for that. I know, uh, I know, Bob, that you're not using the Monte Carlo simulations in your in your process. Is there any specific reason that you're not using uh, Monte Carlo, or do you think that walk forward analysis is just just enough? Um, I don't. I mean, I have an associate who actually is very he uses Monte Carlo analysis in ways that are not the way most people use Monte Carlo analysis, and he thinks it has value. And since he's very bright um, and he's very good at this, I. Uh, I, I give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, I don't think walk Monte Carlo analysis holds a candle to walk forward analysis. If, if that's your if that's your question, but the other reason why I've never used Monte Carlo analysis is never, nobody's ever given me a reason to. I've never seen a reason to use it. I mean, I've never I've right. never been convinced that it actually really offers any real value. Okay. I mean, I, I meant uh, by using Monte Carlo uh, and comparing it to walk forward analysis, of course, it's a totally different approach, but I meant just to see if, if a given strategy is robust so that if Monte Carlo uh, is giving also um, a good results, then you could have more confidence with the strategy. Well, see, I think, um, I think with Monte Carlo, as I understand it, it, that's more likely to be the case if the strategy is extremely active. Um, if it trades a lot, 
I don't think it's is likely to be accurate if, if it doesn't trade, um, if it doesn't trade as much. But I still don't think it really is. Uh, I don't think it really speaks that closely to the issue of robustness, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and what do you think then about genetic programming algorithms? Because nowadays we have more and more publicly available software, which is using uh, this kind of uh, algorithms. So basically um, the software, which, which generates strategies based on the market data automatically, do you see any value um, there for traders using such approach? Um, I think it would be great if it worked. <laughs> 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 I, you know, I, I, I was aware of GAs, you know, way back in the '90s. When they became when they first started started coming out, and we actually in our early software that did that, like the the software we used that was a precursor to um, XT99 was actually a program called Blast, which we sold. Um, it was actually uh, we had actually I I had actually developed a, a method. It was actually a, a lot like um, a GA without even before I even knew they existed. So, and it was actually very hard to program it. So, once we and it worked extremely well. So, because with a GA, for example, you typically get to your you can converge to your solution as a search function in about ten percent of the space. Um, we were able to get we were able to duplicate that. And in those days, speed was always an issue because these computers were a, kind of a, they were slow compared to what they are now. Uh, so it was always an issue to be able to process faster. So, um, but I think that uh, the, I, I've always, a GA can really be programmed to be um, an extremely sophisticated search function if people if people want to. Um, I don't know how, like, I don't know, I, I really don't know how much a lot of people do with that, but I honestly don't, um, I mean, I, I know how, for example, I know how to actually w eventually will just completely automate this process that I have now and I'm actually getting. Um, but it's more like we're actually putting, you know, a little, we're making a little bobby bot. You know, we're actually making a, 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 a kind of make, you know what an expert system is? Yes, I know. Uh, we're essentially, you, we're kind of creating an expert, an expert system which incorporates, you know, my knowledge of how to build strategies. Um, so it'll be a very, um, uh, it'll be an uber sophisticated, very, uh, shall we say kind of intelligent, um, process. I don't know yeah. that, the G I don't know that, I don't really know whether a GA could ever go to that level of sophistication. Um, I, and I honestly think that, um, to do this, to do it, pro to do it well, um, I don't know that a GA could be is, is sufficient, but I, I just all I all I do know is that a little bit that I've seen of programs that create um, that create strategies with no input from the person. They don't. They're not something I would ever trade. They're pretty poor. Mm -hmm. So and um, it's possible. But but I also do believe that it's a matter of time until um, and I did a presentation to some people in Italy about this a couple of years ago. It's just a matter of time. Until all of this, this uber sophisticated artificial intelligence uh, stuff that they have now out there um, becomes essentially, will we'll, I don't think it's ever necessarily going to replace traders, but I think the artificial intelligence you know, will eventually they'll be able to eventually come up with expert systems and algorithms and so forth. They'll be able to trade probably as good as as good, if not a lot better than a lot of really. The average traders. Um, so I, I do think that the I, I do think that artificial intelligence has made is, is going to make a difference. Um, I don't honestly know that it's actually made a difference yet. I, uh, you, know, you hear things. I mean, I you hear things about robot trading firms and so forth, but um, doing all this stuff. But the the evidence since they're all most of them don't do very well trading wise. Um, either they have dumb artificial intelligence robots, or they're just not doing it, or they're not doing it very well. Well, they're not really telling the truth about it. So, but I, I do think it's just a matter of time that we're, artificial intelligence will actually um, be able to weigh in in a very powerful way, um, and including making replacing people who build strategies now. Um, but I, you know, but again, remember one thing: um, I, I, I don't really know. 
I, I guess you really you, could, you really can never say what can possibly happen because look what's happened in the world. All kinds of things we never imagined. Uh, so you, you, it, it's, a, it's a fool's game to say it's impossible. But I do think that where we're at right now with a lot of the uh, GA stuff um, is garbage in, garbage out. Um, so if you, and it's like, it's like, um, you know, with my process, for example, we applied a cruder version of our process for our clients to a client's um, um, algorithms, and they just didn't have the resources to actually get it extremely properly programmed. And so they didn't really particularly, and, 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 the, and the strategies really weren't that great. Um, and ultimately, I, I told them, I told them that they, even with what they were doing, they weren't, the, the, the robustness testing was insufficient, but they didn't listen to me. Um, but the point is, you really have to, uh, if you have a great algorithm, it, you have to be kind of an idiot to screw it up. Um, but, you, you, but on the other hand, um, if you're pretty clever, um, you can take strategies that really are, are not great um, and make them into something that's very, very usable and profitable. You see the yeah, point? Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for that. It's very, very interesting. Um, so, what do you think then about discretionary trading? Um, I think it's fine if you're at it. Okay, so yeah, I so you, you there? I just I, I honestly don't think. I mean, the discretionary trading has always had the same, 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 same limitations. Um, the, one of the biggest advantages of of algorithmic trading is it's scalable. You, there's no, there's really the only limit to scalability right. is how many computers you have and how much money you can trade with. With, um, I mean, even when I worked on the floor years ago, um, you know, most of those guys said the most they could really ever really follow with discretion were three or four markets. Um, and nowadays, that was when people actually did hand charts and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, but nowadays, I think you probably find that most discretionary traders probably have, um, they, they have a lot of backup support from algorithms and from and, and indicators and so forth. Yeah, I know I did I did some work for um, a crowd trading firm where I had a, I had a, 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 a somebody that I knew pretty well, um, and they really um, they were one of the kind of firms that kind of let their their guys come in and sink or swim. Um, but they they were they, they had to pretty much figure it out for themselves. And if they didn't could, couldn't make any money, they just they they they, they got rid of them. But um, You know, I did a project for the guy and gave him a bunch of gave him a bunch of indicators that helped him. Um, so I, I do think it's this what what used to be discretionary trading probably um, isn't much like what discretionary trading used to look like. Um, I have a new a new client who actually they were with one of the oil firms um, and they do discretionary trading. But you know, like with, with in, in, in that business, they get so much color from. They get so much color from you know the um, from the the, the, the the firm they work at. Um, they're essentially maybe not really trading on inside information, but they kind of have. They know they do. They are the ones that know a lot more about these markets than um, than than most guys do. And then, for example, guys who probably you know, when you have the the the, the data feeds that uh, that the proud trading firms have, they see a lot more information about the market, the microstructure, and. and and the structure of the, of the markets than the average guy does. So um, there's just it's just become a different game. Um, but I think in the end, the ultimate limit of discretionary trading is the scalability. Now, if you can, right. you can trade a billion dollars in the market you're in, and you're trading one market with discretion, you know that, that you'll do very well. The people who that that, that, it, that actually happens. But um, in the end, you know, um, it seems to be a lot more work too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Um, uh, Bob, I see that you are publicly offering now Ranger, uh, which is a sophisticated uh, and customizable strategy program. Could you uh, tell us a bit more about it? I mean, especially, uh, for example, I paid attention to the fact that it uses some Donchian approach. So is it also kind uh, some sort of uh, trade trend following strategy? Um, you can trade it that way. The way um, we put Ranger together, the way we actually test and develop strategies for Renaissance. So we have ways of, shall we say, changing the, the ba a base algorithm so we wind up with wholly different trading logics than the core trading logic. So 
Um, whereas you can, in, in its most basic form, Ranger can just be a, a, a customizable dungeon breakout system. And it could be long term as if you want it to be. But there's so many ways to turn it around that, you know, it can be, we can, we actually are making rather short term strategies with it. Um, I have a client who actually came up with a, a heating oil model um, with Ranger. That's actually it. It trades like it trades. You know, it's done hourly bars and it trades two or three times a day, sometimes. So um, the there's so much flexibility in terms of the logics, in terms of the filters, being able to trade mean, in a mean reverting fashion, being able to trade in a, a trend following fashion, uh, being able to trade with with volatility filters, being able to trade with different kinds of different different kinds of targets and different kinds of risk stops. That you know, people could build. You can, you could, you you literally could build um, like we did. There's there, there are three main cores in Renaissance. Ranger will wind up being the fourth core in Renaissance. Um, we'll be able to build a, a whole basket of different of, of uncorrelated trading strategies with uh, with Ranger, um, and you know it comes with a, a over a forty page tutorial which explains how, and it comes with a bunch of workspaces. So. We, you, 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 the, the, the workspaces in the tutorial actually walk you through the same process we use to actually build the strategies that come with Ranger. So, and plus, if you buy the open source version, uh, you're going to have a chance to see how um, you're, you're going to have a chance to see how a sophisticated trading program actually really works from the inside. So, you're um, getting good with Ranger um, is like getting getting your postgraduate degree after your PhD. In my, in my in my estimation, you'll learn a lot of things you've never seen before, um, and uh, um, it's and it's not it's it's not particularly difficult it's it's not particularly difficult to do any of it. It's just a matter of kind of grinding. It's kind of a matter of grinding it out. Makes sense. Okay, that's very, yeah. It makes sense. Very interesting. You mentioned about the uh, open source version. So does it mean it's in the uh, trade station is language? Yes. Uh, that's okay. Right. And basically, there you, you uh, once someone gets it, uh, is just modif- modifying this code to to create new strategies. Or there is a multiple of switches, so you can just uh, customize it to your needs. Yes, there are mo- well, Yes, there are there are over fifty five different different inputs and switches. So yes, you can, you can ultimately, you can modify um, all these, you can modify all these, this, this, these uh, strategies, which is switches. Um, if you, there's nothing to prevent anybody from actually changing the code themselves. They can do that. They can add to it if they want to. Uh, it's open. It's just, it's, it, if you get the open source version, you can do that, um, but it's not necessary. And I think for the most part, in reality, um, I think most people, um, unless they're, Already very sophisticated, um, probably will spend. Um, they'll, they'll, it'll be. It's going to be some time before before they're actually impelled. They actually want to change the code. <laughs> Let's put it that way, because <laughs> there's so many things you can do with it. I mean, I'm I'm still finding out. I mean, we found. Uh, I have a friend. I have a client friend, and who's in France, um, and we've known each other for a long time. And um, you know, he we got to talking about um, volatility expansion and. With the volatility filter that's built into it, we actually built a whole new. We actually were able to build um, a trading strategy, which actually really trades quite literally volatility expansion. Um, and we also found that uh, we can actually kind of by changing some, kind of inverting some of the relationship and some of the some of the parameters um, in Ranger. We actually made it. We made it into a, a very into a short term kind of volatility breakout system. So um, I, I keep on finding stuff out about it. Uh, so I, if I if I am, I'm sure some, somebody else will too. And by the way, the Ranger um, strategies it can be also, I guess, uh, fully automated as it's on trade station. Uh, it basically it, it produces signals. You have to, it does. It's not, um, I it's not automated to actually pump in the signals into trade station into a trade station account directly, although that's something we'll probably do, but it's not doing that right now. That's more relevant if you're trading like hourly bars. Okay. Um, you're also offering some consulting services, and um, my question is to whom it could be most interesting. Um, for years, you were in the CTA uh, business, so is it mostly targeted uh, for professionals? Well, I think it's the kind of thing where, um, you know, it's because I, I – 
it's expensive. It's more bigger traders or professionals who would use it. Um, but it's for anybody who really basically wants to figure out how to actually make make profitable trading strategies. Um, you know, I can I do can I do mentoring, I do coaching, um, I do you know multi month projects. It's just it's, it's it's really kind of up to whatever the person needs. You know, I can pretty much um, I can pretty much do anything people need in this kind of area. I mean, I it's it's foolish to hire someone like me to, to code up your easy language, but um, I can certainly help some. I can, um, but I certainly um, if you have a strategy, if you have an idea you want to actually get put into an automated form and you don't know how to do it, then that, for example, is is perfect um, for me. Um, for I, I, that's something I can do. Uh, if if you have a strategy that's not that's not really working the way you want it to do, and you just have a lot, you have questions about it, um, that's something I can help with. Um, or if you just simply want me to build a a trading program for you. Well, that's that can be done too. So if there, it's anything from the little answering a particular question, a phone call, um, all the way up to you know doing a, a multi-month, even multi-year pro, uh, project. And for that matter, I sometimes that I, I, even though I haven't done this recently, um, I can kind of fill in as a, as a smaller firm's research department or kind of manage their research department and give them direction, sorry. and focus, and so forth. That's very interesting. Um, you also mentioned about the Building Robust Strategies Masterclass. Uh, it's a kind of course, uh, online course. Uh, my question is, is it kind of um, interactive form of your great book, The Evaluation and Optimization of Trading Strategies, or it's something uh, more? Thanks for the kind words. Um, it's, it's more than that. Um, it's, it is, um, it's, it's audiovisual, and we go through lots of examples and um, and you know, and I and I ask you know, Andrew asked me a lot of questions that a person who was that the, that the trader would actually want to want, would want to have would probably want to ask themselves. Um, and we go we go into to a lot of new material in there as well. So I mean, people have thought they could actually. I mean, I, I suppose if you're let's put it this way: if you bought my book and you're a, a super student um, and you really sat down to apply yourself for the next year or two um, and figured it out step by step. Yeah, you don't need a course if you're if you're that right. motivated and you're that organized and you're that that talented. Um, but if you're like most people who are busy um, with one and they want to get they want to get results quickly, um, this is a very very fast track way to learn how to do it. Um, and I, like I said to people in the past, one of the best things about testing a strategy um, is that you, at least you know whether it has a positive expectancy or not, and knowing. Um, if a, knowing how knowing how to see if a strategy basically um, is just a, is a fiction um, is worth its weight in gold because you know the alternative is to start trading it and lose X number of dollars. Um, but you know that's um, it's if you if you take if you study if you study that course and you apply yourself, uh, you should be able to start getting start getting some some good results um, actually rel- relatively quickly. Okay. And if, for example, someone is interested about the Ranger uh, program, do you think that this course is also needed as a kind of prerequisite or the Ranger is just enough and you get all the information there included? Um, it kind of depends on the person. I mean, the, the tutorial um, in Ranger is actually pretty, it's actually really, really good. I, um, I'm, I'm actually proud of it. It's, I think I'm proud of the course also, but I, it turned out extremely well. Um, and mm-hmm. it really, um, if you simply, if you simply, if you were to get Ranger and start applying yourself and working the work, go through the t- tutorial um, and go through the research process on a number of markets, um, I think you learn a lot. You you will learn a lot very very quickly. Um, the the um, the course has is is a little bit. The course has a little bit more to offer if, in terms of if you're going to create your own strategies and pitfalls and guidelines there. Um, so there's a little, there's a, there's a that little bit of a difference. I mean, Ranger has got a cool, got, you have the program. It's, 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 it's extremely, uh, it's a very rich program in itself. The code's very rich. Um, so the code is a, is a great, is a, is a great educational resource all in and of itself. Uh, the tutorial is a, is a very good educational resource. The manual um, really explains all the parameters uh, that are in Ranger and really, um, I, I, I don't want to beat it. I don't want to keep repeat, repeating myself, but that too um, is an education because I, 
I hear a lot of people, I hear people talk about simple strategies and is that a good thing or a bad thing? And then I hear people talk about uber complicated strategies. Um, and in, in the end, all that really matters is that it, it actually work. Um, but at least with something like with, with Ranger, you've got something that can be a very simple strategy that can actually evolve into a, a pretty complex strategy if you, if you so choose. Um, with trend filters and volatility filters and targets and risk stops and so forth. So, and, and understanding how all these things work, um, if you were going to, if you wanted to actually go off on your own and start building your own stuff, uh, there'd be a lot of things that you could actually use from Ranger, um, and the manual that would actually help you there. I mean, like one of the, one of the customers with Ranger, um, is a programmer by trade, a very sophisticated programmer, um, and very, very sharp. Um, and he actually, what he's done is just so he understands it better. He, he found the strategy that you're the alike and he's trading now. Um, it's the, the guy that built the heating oil model. Um, and what he did was he actually kind of, he actually made a little mini version. He, he cut out the code that actually was used in Ranger because a lot of this is all used, of course, uh, in, in any particular strategy. Um, he cut out the pieces that actually, that actually were used so he could better understand how it actually worked. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways to go. Um, and like I say, if you were a really master ranger, not only should you do very, very well with the strategies and the markets, um, uh, but you're going to do, you're going to, your ability to actually understand and build strategies, I think will be dramatically accelerated to a very high level. Okay. Thank you, Bob, for that. Sounds very interesting. I will pull all the links, uh, uh, under this episode. So everyone interested can, uh, find it out there. Um, it's really a very interesting idea and I think it's a very great source of information. Um, so definitely worth to check. Um, we are slowly getting to the end, but my last question is, um, is there any kind of advice you could give to beginner traders? So something you would like to know many years ago when you were in the same position? Uh, <laughs> well, I guess it, back in those days, I just kind of, I, mean, I, I just knew guys who are floor traders and the way they traded, um, it was kind of like an unfair advantage anyway. So that, um, but so I, I knew how those guys traded and I knew it was involved with that. But in those days, I, I would just like, I would just have been happy to know that algorithmic trading actually works. Number one, um, lots of people are making lots and lots of money with algorithmic trading. So that's a big factor. Um, I would say that the, most difficult thing about trading really is not so much the methods themselves as much as the, per the trader. Um, everybody's not cut out to be a trader. It, it takes a certain kind of temperament. Um, and I mean, I, I is a, a friend of mine who's a, 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 is an author who's written some awfully really, really some a, very, very good books. Um, and <laughs> what he keeps on telling me is that he basically, even after all these years, he can't get out of his own way. Um, he basically will overwrite a system or, um, again and again, and it winds up the system makes money and he doesn't. Uh, so I guess the most, the most important thing about trading to be successful at it is you have to trader, know thyself. Uh, you really have to know whether you're cut out for it. Um, and then if you cannot, if you really can actually, um, you know, live through drawdowns um, and learn how to do the work, uh, or get a strategy like Ranger that you know works, um, make sure you really are comfortable with the way that it trades. Um, it's very important that you're comfortable with it's the, the pace of trading, the drawdowns, and you know, the, the, way, it, the, way, um, the way it behaves in, in trending markets. And you really have to be familiar with it and understand it. So I think the other, aside from knowing yourself, um, you really have to know that you have a robust strategy. And uh, that's, you know, there's, you know, I have methods to help people with that these days, of course. And um, But whether you go with me or somebody else, you have to know that what you've got is sound. Uh, if you don't, and, and uh, that's I, from what I hear from a lot of people, um, people still don't really apply them. They really don't, um, they don't really have super good standards as to, as to building strategies and verifying them. Um, so I think it's know thyself know thy strategy um, and then make sure that you and and, and then manage your expectations I mean people want to they want to have they want to put a thousand dollar an account thousand dollars in an account and make a living off of it well right. I, who doesn't 
Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it really works that. I don't think it really works that way. So I think you really have to make sure that um, I think you really have to make sure that your expectations are, are sound. So that if you have a hundred thousand dollar account and you're making twenty five percent a year um, and you want to live off that, then you have to you have to be able to figure out whether whether or not whether or not you can afford to live like that. Um, and blah blah. You, you have to really manage your expectations yeah. so that really you don't um, push yourself too hard because if you push yourself too hard to make more money than your strategy or your account can really manage, you're very likely to take risks um, that'll that are probably be um, be very that could be very dangerous. So all all those things make sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Thank you very much for that. It sounds indeed that uh, people very often have uh, very funny expectations. So, <laughs> sure, they, they, well, they sure do. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Bob, for that. It's uh, it's it was a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Um, to be if here. someone would like to contact you, what's the best way to do this? The very best way to do it is, is to contact me by my email, Bob B O B dot Pardo P A R D O at Pardo Capital dot com. Um, I always see my I, I respond to my email as quick usually usually quite quickly um, calling me with my phone number is actually eight four seven nine two two zero two four eight but you know I with I, I you know I'm busy almost I'm busy always um, and so I, I really like to have phone calls that are that are pre-scheduled as opposed to just spontaneous um, but email is the best one um, it could be a longer short okay. one um, and we can go from there all right thank you very much i will put all the information on my website at system trader.show so everyone interested is welcome to check it out thank you very much for that and um, yeah and uh, i wish you all the best thank, thank you. you bye bye take care bye, bye.